give out this as the same person as the West Coast unless there was something to this. In the last 22 years, I've talked to hundreds of what we call adult survivors. And uh, the next major case I'd like to mention is the Nebraska case. Um, in 1988, I received a phone call from Lincoln, Nebraska. One of my college friends said, Ted, you better get back here. There was a major investigation uh, headed up by John DeCamp, former state senator, a good friend of mine. And uh, John had uh, taken on the task of exposing a group of high-level politicians in the state of Nebraska and some of the top businessmen. As a result of this case, uh, the kids who were part of the network came forward. There were 80 children because of the publicity on a pedophile a pornographic arrest. Four of them gave statements. Uh, two of the four later recanted. Two stood by what they originally initially said. And what we developed there was that children were being taken out of orphanages and foster homes, driven to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, and flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. Uh, the person in charge was a fellow named Larry King, a black man, not Larry King Live. And he was uh, president of the, of the Franklin Savings and Loan, which was a savings and loan established to help the minorities. He had a salary of $17,000 a year. He was paying $5,000 a month for a condominium in Washington, D.C. for these parties. As a result of the investigation, we learned also that there was an international child kidnapping ring operating out of the Midwest and all the way into Washington, D.C. Uh, Paul Benassi, one of the kids who I interviewed for five hours, I've got him on five hours of tape, by the way. I need to get, make that tape available to you, but I'm so busy, I'm kind of like a one-armed paper hanger that I just haven't had time to do it. But Paul Benassi, when he was uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, was recruited by these people to be one of them and to act as a, a, a buffer and in shopping centers, parks, public places, to attract the children at his age over near the car. The adults in the, involved in the ring would grab them and uh, they would kidnap them. Uh, the kids, uh, of course, talked about satanic cult ceremonies. They talked about the kidnapping ring. Uh, Paul's life has been uh, turned upside down because he refused to recant as did Alicia Owens, the other person who refused to recant. Alicia's still serving time in prison for lying to the grand jury. She was convicted of that. When she was 14 years old, she had sex with the chief of police, Bob Wadman. That's what she said. And the other kids backed her up. Other uh, top businessmen who were identified were Harold Anderson, publisher of the Omaha World Herald, the head of the Society Page in Omaha, uh, Eugene Mahoney, who was a former vice squad police officer in Omaha and uh, is now head of the forestry service for the state of Nebraska. And the list goes on and on and on. The uh, pedophile ring, homosexual pedophile ring, uh, they were transporting these kids from Omaha to Des Moines to Minneapolis to Milwaukee to Madison and back to Omaha. So, um, unfortunately, the investigator prior to my entering the case, Gary Caradori, uh, had learned about some pictures. And these pictures were the smoking gun of the case. Pictures of politicians having sex with children and other unbelievable acts, boys and girls and so forth. So. Uh, the official photographer of the group was a fellow named Rusty Nelson, Russell Nelson. And Rusty was a farm boy from Nebraska. He had never seen the bright lights of the big city. And uh, he uh, was enamored with uh, the rich and the famous and the jet airplanes and the trips around the world, actually. And he was a professional photographer, and he started out by uh, working in a gay club, taking pictures for the club, and he was recruited from there into the, the, the sex ring. Uh, Rusty 
was not himself homosexual, I'm convinced of, but I've spent quite a bit of time with him. He, um, in connection with uh, his uh, work, uh, would sneak a, reel, a roll of film in on occasion when he was photographing these acts because they were taking the, quote, official film away from him as soon as it was completed. Rusty sent these pictures back home and he also scattered them around the United States, negatives and photographs themselves. Uh, he was sold for sex by Larry King to a businessman in Washington, D.C. and he said to the businessman, let me go in the bathroom and wash up and instead of coming back out, he went out the back window and he disappeared. He was living on a farm, his, one of his parents' farms in Nebraska for quite a while. And the FBI came around to his parents' home asking for Rusty. And uh, the mother said, well, he's over at such and such a farmhouse. They went over and interviewed him. And of course, uh, it was basic, as he told me, it was an harassment. And then he left and had to uh, go into hiding someplace else. He, his folks came back several months later to the farm to check it out. It, was, it had been abandoned, it was, but it was a beautiful place, a mile and a half from any neighbor. And somebody had gone in with high-powered rifles and totally destroyed it, tipped over the furnace. They shot 13 bullets through the refrigerator door, front, out the back, and out the house. You know what a powerful weapon that had to be. They shot bullets into the ceiling and out the walls. There was a van outside uh, that was running. They shot it up, broke all the windows. Rusty, I asked Rusty, in fact, I asked him on camera, and I'll tell you a little bit about Rusty in just a few minutes, in addition to what I'm telling you now. How and who would know that uh, this was there, that you were there, and so forth? He said the only people that knew were his parents and then the FBI. He's convinced that this was a tactic by the FBI. John DeCamp, the state senator, state senator, who was really headed up the whole investigation, and who, by the way, has obtained a $1 million judgment, um, has uh, been diligently working on the case and has refused to back down. Uh, Rusty, after the FBI interviewed him on his farm, decided he had to hit the road. And so he obtained um, a van and some window washing equipment. This is pretty clever of what he did because he knew that they'd be tracing him, looking for him. And he drove all over the United States, in and out of towns, and washed windows. No record of a pay stub. Uh, but unfortunately, about three years later, uh, they caught up with him in Portland, Oregon. And um, he was arrested for having a, a broken taillight. In the back of his van, he had pictures of nudes, which professional photographers do on a regular basis, nothing pornography. And the police told him that there was a juvenile picture, a picture of a juvenile in the back of the van, uh, and therefore they arrested him and he was sentenced to two years in prison. He never faced his accuser. They would never tell him the name of the person who was supposedly a juvenile. Rusty's out and on probation. When he gets off probation, I located him in a farm in Oregon. And I drove from Las Vegas up to Oregon, picked him up and brought him back. And uh, then I said to Rusty, I said, Rusty, let's go look for those pictures. And uh, Rusty said, good idea, let's go. So last uh, October, November, for two and a half months, Rusty and I uh, lived out of the back of my pickup truck. Nothing fancy, a four-cylinder Nissan that could barely get up the hills in Colorado. And as a matter of fact, on one occasion, it stalled. <laughs> we were going up through this pass, and I just couldn't go any higher, even in first gear. Anyway, Rusty had a number of locations where he placed these pictures, at least he said that. Uh, there were five in Colorado. And we went to the first one, which was an abandoned uh, mine mill. He had placed them up behind the rafters toward the back of the mill. The pictures were gone. 
but there was a dynamite cap there. The second location was uh, up about two miles up a mountain. Went up there and it appeared that those pictures had been washed away. The third location was a mine. We found the mine and it had the steel door on it so we couldn't get in. The fourth location was in a cave on the side of a cliff near a waterfall about 300 feet straight down. And Rusty had weighed 165 pounds when he hit it in that cave. He now weighs about 240. So uh, we went into town and I got a nice uh, rope, good rope that hold 2,200 pounds as I recall, a harness, hooked it on the back of my truck for safety and we lowered him down. Well, he slipped and it was getting dark and he hurt himself and unfortunately because of the difference in the weight, 165 to 240, he couldn't pull himself back up. So I, we, I had a handy talk. I said, Rusty, uh, let's, come on, we'll come back next year. Come on up. So we finally got him up and we went on our way. Uh, and going back to the farmhouse where somebody shot it up and I would have to say it was probably the FBI. Rusty had hidden some of the pictures under the desk, the top of the desk, in the farmhouse. These are pictures of some of our leading politicians having sex with kids, okay? And that when we were there, we examined it, and of course the desk had been pried open and the pictures were gone. The question then arises, well, Rusty, how do I know there are any pictures? And if there were, how do we know that somebody came along and got them? And how would they know that they were there? Rusty told me when he was in jail in Portland, um, he thought he was doped, drugged. And uh, they'd come in, guards and other men would come in at night and, and interview him. And he thinks he may have told them at that time where some of the locations of the pictures are. But there are some other locations that uh, there's no need to discuss them here in detail. Uh, but as a result of that trip, and really the real basis for the trip, is to do a video, do our own video, Rusty and John DeCamp and I. Now, on the back table back there, I've got a videotape that says Conspiracy of Silence. Let me tell you about this, and this is where I came up with the idea to grab Rusty and go find these pictures. There was a TV crew from Yorkshire Television in England that came over in the early 1990s. They were here for seven months and uh, they filmed this whole case, the one I'm telling you about. It was to be aired on Discovery Channel May the 4th, 1994 and even listed in the TV guide but at the last minute somebody came in and bought up the rights and ordered that all the copies be destroyed. I hold in my hand a bootleg copy of that show. And what we are going to do, Rusty and I and John DeCamp, we're going to complete this story and nobody's going to buy us off. I don't know if we can get it on Discovery Channel or not, but we're going to do our own video. We're going to basically include the information here on this video and we're going to update it. We're going to include the $1 million judgment. We're going to include information about more details about the kidnapping ring and including an interview with Noreen Gosh. Noreen Gosh's 12-year-old son was kidnapped back in 1982, Johnny Gosh. There's a book out. It's called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. And I was supposed to have a case up here tonight, but um, something happened. I guess, I don't know, maybe they're in the mail someplace. But uh, Paul Bonassi helped kidnap Johnny Gosh. And he gave us a statement to that effect. And uh, they uh, took Johnny uh, that first day. He was kidnapped on a Sunday. He was uh, delivering his Sunday Des Moines Register. Took him to a safe house in Sioux City, Iowa. He, they kept him there. And according to information developed by the mother, Noreen Gosh, uh, the snatching of the child was ordered by a fellow named Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino, head of the Temple of Set out of San Francisco. This is in her book. And Michael Aquino wrote me a letter because I quoted him someplace and challenged me on it, but I said, hey, it's in the book. It's in Noreen Gosh's book. 
Anyway, uh, young Johnny and another kid ended up stealing a car, and uh, they went into hiding. They lived on an Indian reservation for quite a while up in uh, northern Minnesota, and uh, it was they were discovered there, and they had to move on. Yeah, Johnny Gosh is alive today. I know approximately where he is, but he doesn't dare come forward because he knows too much. He knows too many people are involved. The uh, the video, by the way, that that uh, back there on the back desk is uh, I'm selling it for thirty dollars. And if you decide to buy it, the second video will be sent to you free. But if you do buy it, there's a sheet back there, and I want you to be sure to sign your name and address and so forth so we can get that second video to you. Along with the video, uh, you get a free CD. There's a story behind the CD. It seems like everything I do, I, there's a story behind it, okay? This CD is called... Uh, it's a song by a fellow named uh, Dave Pesnell. It's called Judas of D.C. Now Dave, I've known Dave about 20 years, and uh, he bought uh, quite a bit of land outside San Bernardino, California, worthless land basically, that's why he got it so cheap. He learned there was a water uh, table underneath it. He made a deal with the Japanese, uh, into some Japanese private businessmen they were going to build a plant because of the water there. He went out one day to inspect the land. He was met by soldiers, U.S. Army uniforms, with automatic weapons told, uh, get off the land. You can't come here. Dave ended up going to court. He lost in court. But what they didn't know about Dave, or if they did, they didn't do anything about it, he's a musician. And so he wrote this song, Judas of D.C., and it talks about how we are being double-crossed by the Washington gangsters. It doesn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats. There's not a dime's worth of difference between any of them. Okay? But this, is, this goes along with the videotape if you decide to buy it. Also, there's something else that's very interesting. In the trial, which resulted in a $1 million judgment, I have the transcript back there. It's uh, probably 160 pages. Um, it's available, and it's fascinating reading, fascinating reading. I've accumulated 22 years of, re of research and written these own books for myself. I might make five, six bucks a book, okay? So you don't get rich doing this. In fact, you go broke doing it. Every dime I have, I put into this cause. So um, I urge you to buy some of my reports, my personal reports, and make copies. I'm not in this because I'm... There's nothing back there copyrighted. Buy it, make copies, spread the word, okay? Now, um, there's, there's something else that I need to bring uh, to your attention. This is a book about the CIA, the Finders. This tied back into the Nebraska case. The Finders is a CIA covert operation. As far as I know, it's still operating. That was established in the early uh, 1960s. And their task at hand was to kidnap children. Going back to the Nebraska case, what do they do with these kids that they kidnap? Paul Benassi has attended six auctions where they auction children. Anyway, any age from three and four all the way up to 21. They put a tag around their neck, they're in their underwear, they have a number on the tag, and people down below bid on them. The kids sell for between fifteen to fifty thousand dollars. I've even heard of one kid going for hundred thousand. Well, who's buying them? According to Paul, you can't afford that, huh? Okay, you don't want it either, I'm sure. According to Paul, they're one of the locations outside of Las Vegas, about 50 miles outside of Las Vegas, and I located it. It's an uh, airstrip. I went up with a friend of mine, and we found it. And uh, there were airplanes there. There were campers there. Uh, and uh, there were uh, men who, with foreign accents, there was a police officer there, at least somebody in a uniform. Kids are auctioned off and put on the airplane, and nobody knows what's happened to them. 
Now, in the last four years, we've had, we meaning, I network with a lot of people, of course. We've had information from two airline employees, one in Denver, Colorado, and one in Los Angeles, LAX. In Denver, Colorado, I happened to be lecturing there that night that this occurred. And an airplane with 210 children was being fueled in Denver. The employee who was working there asked uh, one of the adults, there were two men and one woman, what's going on here with these kids? She said, Child Protective Service is none of your business. Mind your own business. Those kids were being flown to Paris, France, okay? In uh, Los Angeles, LAX, another one of my sources received a call from an airline employee, same situation, different plane. And these kids were being flown to Paris, France. There, in 1997, there was the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997 that was passed under the Clinton administration. And what that did, it took children who were abused out of the biological home, put them in foster homes, and then put them up for adoption. Okay? And you don't know this, or maybe you do, but if Child Protective Services receives even an anonymous phone call from a neighbor, and that neighbor says that that parent slapped that kid, they can come in and grab that child. The title of the act again, Adoption and Safe Families Act, yeah? It's not Safe Families Act, it's Safe Kidnapping Act. There are 3,000 children who are taken away from the biological parents every day of the week. A friend of mine, good friend of mine, in fact, I used to have a radio talk show, I had a radio talk show for two years. Um, and uh, her name is Suzanne Shell. She had her kid taken away from her. She was like Noreen Gosh. She wasn't going to stand for it. By the way, Noreen's been on every TV show in America, too. And uh, in addition to this book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, uh, she's done a tremendous job. And if every parent who lost a child would do what Noreen Gosh has done, we wouldn't have this problem. Okay, Suzanne Schell, she's a fighter, too. And she wrote this book, Profane Justice, Comprehensive Guide to Asserting Your Parental Rights. This book points out that in 1974, four to five children a day were dying of child abuse. In 1997, four of five children a day were still dying of child abuse. The only difference was that half of them died in foster homes. Between 1997 and 2002, the goal of the federal government is to double adoptions by offering financial incentives to remove children from their homes and terminate parental rights. Of all the children taken from the biological parents, placed in farm, uh, foster homes, and then uh, for adoption, of all the children that are taken, only 37% return home. So what's happening to these kids, okay? Well, I just recently learned, and I don't have any, I've got a lot of material for the screen, but you know, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, anyway, what's happening to these kids is they're being placed in the foster home, and then they're being adopted. And once they get into the system, they're adopted, you don't hear about them anymore. They are gone, okay? I suspect that some of these kids on these airplanes were adopted children. There is a network of criminals that have set up a money-making scheme at the expense of our children. When a child is placed into adoption, the federal government gives the state $4,000 for each child and up to $6,000 for a special needy child. There's a racket going on in America today where the kids 
are being placed into adoption. And let's say, for example, Joan Smith, say four or five years old, is placed up for adoption and is adopted and is gone. That same person is then changed to Joan Smithley. And then they change the name again. They change it four times. And then they adopt that same person 75 times. 79 times $4,000 is a lot of money. And you have, you have this network of criminals, you have attorneys, you have judges who are involved in this. That's not all. That is not all. Then what happens is once the adopted parent gets the child and starts receiving the money, and by the way, they go on Medicaid right away too, by the way. Once the adopted parents gets a hold of that child, and who knows what happens to the kid, of course, the, in this particular area in the Southwest, this network of criminals files a lawsuit against that person and collects the money. Okay, and then that person who is set up as the adopted parent receives their cut, the networks receive a cut, the judges receive a cut because they're, they're involved in phony lawsuits. This is going on right today. The person who gave me this information, and I, again, I just received this about two weeks ago, went back to the Clinton White House and talked to them about this, contacted the FBI and talked to them about this. Nobody is doing anything about it. Too many high-level people involved. Okay, let's, uh, let's scoot along. By the way, uh, the Finder's Report, just a minute, let me finish. The Finder's Report is back there, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for you for documentation about our great CIA. The great CIA is not only involved in adopt, I mean, kidnapping children, they're the biggest drug dealer in the world. As we know, Iran-Contra. And the CIA is the most evil organization that's ever been established in the history of the world. And the FBI is right along behind them. The FBI is involved too. I'm gonna document information on the screen now about the finders. I have been to the FBI a half a dozen times and filed a formal complaint and they have yet to interview me or to even contact me. Okay? And uh, let's start. Oops. Let's talk about before I go into the finders, let me just throw a few things up here about... No, this is the finder. Reader's Digest, July 1982, 100,000 children miss, are missing every year. We're not talking about runaway teenagers, we're talking about kids that are two, three, four years old. They just disappear off the street. The great FBI will tell you how many bank robberies occurred last year, how many... Uh, uh, statutory rapes occurred. They'll tell you about armed robberies and ca uh, stolen cars. They won't give you figures on the missing children. Here's the finders. That's the great seal of the great CIA. This is your documentation. This has been given to the FBI by me personally. The top says uh, Department of the Treasury, U.S. Customs. This is a case that broke in 1987. And at that time, there was a, two well-dressed men in a van, Dodge van, that uh, were with six children, ages, as you see down here, two to six and seven years of age. They were in a park. The kids were shabbily dressed. The men were very well-dressed. The men had passports on them. The police went out and talked to them 
And the children said that they were en route to Mexico to a smart school. Uh, the men refused to talk. The information was, the van had Virginia license plates on it, and the information was sent back to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., and the files were checked there, and they learned that there had been information there about blood rituals that had taken place, and possibly a homicide. And uh, by the way, the Metropolitan Police Department obtained a search warrant, and that's where they came up with this information. Um, there was a much more detail on it than what I'm giving you, but this is the report itself. And if you'll notice down here at the bottom, inspection of the premises revealed that organizations in different places in the world were involved in this project. And you see here it says London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, Europe, and so forth. And there was a Palestinian aspect to it. And here's this kind of interesting. There was one, a code word called uh, Operation Pentagon or Break-In Pentagon. Is, is it on there? I don't see it right now. It was a code word. Yeah, okay, here it is. The Pentagon Break-In. Obviously a code word. So what happened? The customs agent uh, who investigated this was in contact with the Metropolitan Police Department. He went over there for a briefing to the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. on April the 2nd. And uh, he w had been working with the detective Bradley. Um, and at that time, he was referred to a third person, probably somebody didn't want his name in his report. And he was advised that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State Department, in turn, advised the Metropolitan Police Department that travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This includes travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam in the late 1950s and the mid-1970s. Well, it was illegal to travel in those countries in those days. The individual further advised of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activities of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police Department report had been classified secret and was not available for results. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's Division 5 in headquarters, which handles all counterintelligence and counterespionage and so forth, uh, informed uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police and Customs uh, that they should not furnish the information to the Washington Field Office, which is the investigative uh, arm of the FBI in that area, not headquarters.